Not a single person within the Yeshiva Centre leadership has been held to account in any way, shape or form. In fact, in some cases, they've actually seemingly uh, been uh, elevated to other roles. You know, I mean, Rabbi Glick is now the, the, uh, the former principal at the time, is now the chair of the uh, spiritual committee which heads the Yeshiva Centre after the passing of Rabbi Groner. So, arguably the most uh, powerful position. So, the message that, sent, that is sent out to victims is, we don't take this issue seriously. Oh, we've got great policies and procedures in place, but, you know, it happened decades ago, get over it. We'll ignore the fact that there were allegations of, of you know, three, four, five years ago, but times have changed. So, I do still think that, I think a problematic culture is an understatement of uh, what is going on within the Yeshiva Centre at the moment. In the synagogue, I spoke to Dirk at the time when I was still there. A very nice old man, a Holocaust survivor, who berated me once, in a nice way, friendly. It's, it's not, um, in, in the old home, it was in Yiddish the whole thing, but in the old home we didn't dob people in. It wasn't the done thing. I said, well, what would you do? How would you deal with the matter? we'd send him away. I said, well, that's what they did. And it didn't help. It just brought the problem somewhere else. So that means even after everything that's happened and everything that's come out, there's still even good people that think like that. So no one has come forward with any other solution. It's be quiet, send them away, all this type of nonsense. One thing that I guess I don't think you featured in the film and, and perhaps a lot of people don't know, I personally approached the Yeshiva Centre leadership to try to resolve this matter a long time ago. After I went public with my story, as I said, initially I went to the police, I went to Rabbi Groner, got nowhere, went public with my story. Of course, Yeshiva wouldn't have appreciated that. But then subsequently, I did try, both personally and through uh, mediators, to try to resolve the matter. I'm not talking about seeking compensation or anything along those lines. It's simply to sit down and have a confidential and honest conversation with them. They refused repeatedly. Now, one thing Yeshiva and Chabad are very good at, Chabad globally, is, is incredible uh, public relations, marketing. Anyone who knows Chabad, I mean, you don't need to go to school for that. You go to Chabad, they'll teach you how to do it. And if I was their PR agent, one thing I'd be telling them, just sit down with Manny, who's the only victim who's come out publicly, See what he wants to say, and, and even make an apology if you think that might be okay, and try to resolve it that way. And I promise you, we would not be sitting here today had that occurred. There are at least over a dozen who are confirmed through the courts, and therefore they are victims, and then there are the alleged victims, many of those. Why couldn't you shiver ever, even tomorrow? I mean, after watching this film, surely they'll get up and wake up to their senses, and if they, if they can't do it themselves, and surely their donors will be able to say, what are, we, we, what are we contributing to? Sure, we want to make sure our kids have a good Jewish education, but how can we be involved? How can we support an institution which seemingly has no morals? Why can't they just get up and say, I'm not on a legalistic letter. We wish to apologise unreservedly for crimes that may have occurred. I'm talking about, as, as Rabbi Kutnik himself said in the film, a personal apology. One has the idea, in the more ultra-Orthodox you go, that you've got it all right, and good religious people don't do this sort of stuff, and they don't cover up, and they couldn't have done it, and this rabbi couldn't have known about all these different perpetrators and done nothing over a period of years, that will shatter some people's belief in that. It's existential. And I genuinely believe that that's perhaps 40% of the problem of the cover-up. It's an exist existential problem which people cannot, they just don't know how to face it. And it's, you're not allowed to talk about it. No one will talk about it. No one will address it. And they're left with it. So the best thing is just shut up, abuse the victim, abuse their families, abuse anybody that talks about it. And then we can just go on as usual. That's what, it's what you were intimating there. It's a part of the defence mechanism. Having tried to speak to the yeshiva and people in the yeshiva community, 
during the year or so in which we were making this film, there was, uh, on the one hand, this almost sense of denial. Um, there was denial, there was fear, because there were people who wanted to speak to us, who said, I agree with Lanny, or I know that there are problems. So I would say, well, speak to us on camera, or at least if you feel you can make a difference in the community, say something. And they would say, can't take that risk, because we don't want to become another wax family. Then I would have communications with people who would be suspicious, if not doubtful, even of facts, like court convictions. And I would say, they would say, no, the Yeshiva's done everything, and Manny Wax is on a campaign, his anti-religious campaign, and Zephania Wax has got this long history agenda with the Yeshiva Center, and I'd go, all right, but what about the two court convictions? Go, well, that's different. Now, whether it's because it does undermine the very essence of their faith, whether there is too great a risk because they're not going to be able to get a shidduch, they're not going to be able to marry off their kids, or whatever it is, but there is a, certainly a mindset there that I've come across as someone from outside, as a filmmaker, completely unwilling to engage in any way whatsoever um, on this issue. And, and I, in fact, the only communication we've had in the whole process was when there was an email from one of the WAX, uh, Facebook posts from one of the WAX children that we featured in the film that was critical of, of Stefania and Manny. That was the only time I got a communication from people in the Yeshiva community. The whole thing. See? This is now everything you need to know. So, it was like, when is that community actually going to come to grips with the issue? Now, I understand it's difficult, and I understand it's painful, and I understand it's complex, but you have to begin that process. And as an outsider looking in, my experience today is that there is no desire, no attempt, no willingness to do so in any shape, size, or form whatsoever. We're working closely with a number of Jewish schools, and, um, and I can tell you now in terms of Tzedek, um, until now we've been focusing much more on the reactive side of things, which is about assisting victims, uh, focusing on the past, responding to the abuse allegations, and, and I think we need to move in, in, in terms of the future, much more focus on the proactive side, which is awareness raising and education. And to that end, uh, that is a key priority for us. We're in the process of putting together a, uh, a, a committee and, and we're working in the area of education. So no one really wants to share their story publicly. There's only one other person in Australia, uh, sorry, former Australian, I can say his name because he's gone on the public record, uh, Jakob Wolf, uh, the son of Rabbi Label Wolf. He went public that, that he had also been another victim of David Cyprus, um, but he lives in the US. And he also, he's not an activist, he's not taking a leadership role in this area. Um, I, I know him and I asked him whether he would feel comfortable talking to a journalist who was interested in speaking to him about it, to another victim. He agreed and that's it. So another question that needs to be asked is, why is no one else comfortable speaking up publicly about this? There's been a group within the yeshiva who have made it their business to make it toxic for me in Melbourne. They are, that's why I resisted in the beginning leaving Yeshiva, because I knew that's what they wanted. But ultimately, you know, I just couldn't take it anymore. So I dropped out during the week and then I dropped out on Shabbos. And I still had the heart attack. But uh, that's the reason I don't go to any other synagogue either. It's certainly not a Chabad one, because there's like sort of alien agents there, which would make me feel uncomfortable. That means even though some people see what the bad that's happened to us, some will know that it actually can be done, that people have come forward, people are sitting in jail. The idea of someone that wanted to do the same sort of thing that we've done now, my advice to them would be to try and get other people together with you. Try and somehow, the victim might know of other victims, maybe if, if these people want to do it, Manny may be able to pass a message to another victim, if there was even two people, or certainly three, that would come forward together, I believe that would shatter the whole thing. If there would be three people within Yeshiva today that would get up together, not just one wax family, three different families that would do it, and it's feasible. I mean, there's... Kramer himself, I have a witness that's spoken to me that the 
president at the time of the yeshiva center came in and told Rabbi Groner in front of this person that they themselves had identified 60 victims of Kramer. He was charged with four and convicted of four. But they themselves admitted 60s. Because the only way it's going to change is if people within the community stand up and say something. But there's fear. I, I could not believe the things I've been told. When I've, I've really implored people, and they've said to me, I would, but my wife will lose her friends. I would, this I couldn't believe, but my kids will get bullied at Yeshiva. I mean, that's the extent of it. Okay. Yeah. Ready. One, two. Beautiful. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Do you feel like yeah. you have closure, Manny? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very tough question. Do I have closure? I think I have a sense of empowerment now, uh, something that I've never had uh, until the last couple of years. For me personally, I don't necessarily feel I have closure, but I also don't feel that I necessarily need to have closure. For me, by uh, being involved in this campaign and supporting other victims and, and preventing, to some degree, future cases makes me feel um, uh, a sense of empowerment and, and certainly is, is, is towards the direction of closure if I'll ever get there and if I ever need to get there. Whatever you think you're being smart down here, just think one day, according to your own professed belief system, you're going to have, have to face a different type of judge. Not one that you can trick and not one you can fool and not one you can tell stories to. Just think about that. All your stories and all your nonsense from now is eventually going to be judged one day and dealt with one day. If you don't believe that, take off your beard and, and coat anyway. And if you do believe it, think seriously about what that means.